The story begins with a computer engineer named Max, who is wrapping up his work in Thailand and heading back to his home country, the USA, upon arriving at his hotel after work. The receptionist hands him a package from an unknown sender. Inside, he finds an advanced, cutting-edge smartphone in it without giving it much thought. He sets the phone aside and goes about his business. However, the phone suddenly rings, with a message displaying that hotel prices will be 50% off this weekend. Max confirms the offer with the receptionist and decides to extend his stay in Thailand for two more days to enjoy the discount. Later that evening, Max catches sight of a news report revealing that the plane he was originally supposed to be on has crashed with no survivors. A chill runs down his spine as he realizes he narrowly escaped the tragedy. Just then, he receives another message on his phone, advising him to buy shares of Kair Company to make money. Max ignores the message, but later when he returns to his hotel room, he is bewildered by the news on the TV that informs that the shares of CR Company have suddenly skyrocketed. As Max prepares to leave for the USA, he receives yet another message instructing him to travel to Prague. Without hesitation, Max cancels his initial flight and decides to head to Prague after arriving at the Prague airport. Max quick takes a taxi to the Empire Hotel, as suggested. In the message, the taxi driver Yuri strikes up a conversation and praises Max's phone, mentioning that it's the most advanced model and has yet to be released on the market. Yuri reveals that he hails from Russia and possesses substantial technical expertise, offering his assistance to Max if he encounters any issues with his phone once at the hotel. Max tries to track down information about the center of the package through the shipping company, but the company refuses to disclose such information due to its policy. Shortly after, Max receives another message on his phone instructing him to try his luck at slot 13 in the hotel's casino. However, when he arrives, another person is already playing the machine. Suddenly, Max gets another message predicting that the fourth spin will hit the jackpot. Max offers the man $20 to exchange his seat, but the guy couldn't care less and keeps playing as he's about to spin for the fourth time. Max grabs the man's hand and raises the offer to $100, which the man accepts in exchange for his spot. Max then tries his luck by pressing the button and miraculously wins a whopping $300,000. The casino's manager, John, is bewildered to witness the unfolding events through the security cameras and instructs his team to keep a close eye on Max. Just then, Max receives another message instructing him to move his winnings to the blackjack table following the instructions. Max bets all his winnings on a hand of blackjack once again, and the message proves to be spot on as Max wins. Big noticing Max's remarkable streak, John is taken aback and observes that Max has been discreetly using his phone while playing. He dispatches one of his associates to inform Max that the use of phones is strictly prohibited within the casino premises. Despite his big wins, Max is still not satisfied and wants to win more. He steps outside the casino and contacts Yuri, seeking a way to receive messages without having to visibly check his phone. Yuri agrees to help, demands a fee of $500 for his services. Max agrees to the terms, and since Yuri needs some time to arrive, he heads back into the casino inside. Max comes across a drunken man attempting to force himself on his girlfriend. He steps in help, but the man punches him, knocking Max unconscious. It turns out that this was all a setup, and the fake couple are associated with the casino, and they conspired to create a distraction in order to clone Max's SIM card and trace the messages he's been receiving. When Max regains consciousness, the man is gone, leaving the woman behind. She introduces herself as Camila, and Max begin to flirt with her. Their conversation is cut short when Yuri calls, asking Max to meet him outside the casino. Meanwhile, when John's team tries to trace the messages on Max's SIM card, they are shocked to discover that there is no record of them anywhere in the world outside. Max meets Yuri, who hands him a pair of text-to-speech Bluetooth earbuds that allow Max to discreetly listen to messages without looking at his phone. Max is amazed by the advanced technology, considering it's the year 2009, armed with a new gadget. Max heads back into the casino and places a bet on the largest machine with a prize of $3 million, sensing his confidence. John immediately dispatches security after him, just like before Max wins again, but suddenly finds himself being chased by security guards. As he tries to escape, he is confronted by the FBI. Agent Grant takes him into custody. Sean also arrives at the scene, insisting that Max is the casino's concern, but Grant warns him that staying out of this would be in his best interest. It is revealed that Grant and JN share a history, as John was a former FBI agent. Grant leads Max to an abandoned building where he interrogates Max at gunpoint regarding the phone and its messages. Max explains that he had received the phone in a parcel and was simply trying to generate some income using its guidance, observing the genuine fear on his face. Grant believes his story. Shortly 
shortly afterward, John also arrives at the scene, prompted by the casino owner's request to investigate recent losses. Realizing that John won't leave, Grant shares all the information with him. He explains that the FBI is working with the NSA and Trum, trying to track down individuals who have made substantial amounts of money through coordinated messages. Besides being American, there is nothing common among these individuals. Strangely, every time the FBI moved to apprehend them, they died under mysterious circumstances. Fortunately for Max, he is already in custody before that happened. Grant then confronts Max, telling him that if he doesn't want to face jail time for the scams he pulled at the casino, he must follow his orders and help them track down the messages with no other choice. Max agrees to cooperate. Grant keeps his phone and warns Max not to leave the hotel due to potential threats to his life, then contacts his superior bro and requests the activation of the Echelon program. Brooke assures him that the Echelon system will be up and running within three hours while at the hotel Max receives a call from Camilla, inviting him for a drink at a local bar. Despite Grant's warning, Max leaves the hotel and meets Camilla at the bar. However, their time together is cut short. An FBI officer arrives and escorts Max back to the hotel in order to trace the source of the messages. Grant gives Max his phone and explains that he must follow the instructions of the next three messages, just as he has done before Max places all of his winnings in accordance with the messages. To his surprise, he loses all of his money this time. He then receives another message warning him that he will be killed if he turns off the phone again. But an FBI officer arrives and takes the phone from his hand before turning it off as the NSA's AI system. Echelon begins to trace the origin of the messages. They are shocked to discover that the source is none other than Echelon itself. Brooke suspects that someone has hacked Echelon, and using it to send messages, he immediately orders everyone to shut it down and abort the mission he contacts Grant and instructs him to do the same. Subsequently, he initiates an investigation to uncover the hacker. The Finn findings reveal that no external entity was involved in the hack. Later that night, Camilla invites Max to her place where she prepares a heartfelt meal for him. The next morning, John meets with a casino owner and informs him that the NSA has called off their investigation. However, the casino owner instructs John to carry out his own independent investigation to uncover the source of the mysterious messages Johan then calls Camilla, asking her to keep Max indoors to prevent him from meeting the same fate as the previous phone holders. Meanwhile, Kent receives a new message containing an address on the phone. Instead of sending Max, Kent dispatches one of his agents to the location with the phone. Just as the agent arrives, a second message comes through, directing him to cross the road. Tragically, the agent meets with a fatal accident while crossing the road, a fate that had been intended for Max, shocked by what he witnesses. Meanwhile, Max delves deeper into his research on the Echelon program and discovers that the NSA can not only access every citizen's messages, but also tap into surveillance cameras across the country. He shares this with Camila, who suddenly spots a sniper on a rooftop across the street, reacting quickly. She shoves Max out of harm's way, narrowly avoiding the bullet. She also notices two men ascending the stairs with the intent to eliminate them. She locks Max in a room to safeguard him and attempts to arm herself with a gun, but the sniper manages to shoot her in the hand. Despite her injury, she employs an iron rod to fend off one of the attackers through the door. However, the second assault breaks in, leading to a fierce struggle. Just as the situation intensifies, Max emerges from the room and helps Camilla together. They overpower the attacker, ultimately killing him. Max is shocked to witness Camilla's combat skills and realizes that she works for John at the casino just then. John arrives at Camilla's house and drives Max to a secure location. He reveals to Max that the NSA wants him dead because of the knowledge he has acquired about the Echelon program, and Bro cannot risk this information being exposed to the public. JN explains to Max that the only way out is to uncover the source of the messages. Max tells him about Yuri, the tech-savvy taxi driver in Moscow, suggesting that he could potentially help unravel the mystery behind the messages. JN, however, argues how a taxi driver could figure out something that top NSA experts have failed to discover, but Max manages to convince him by citing examples of how Russians have often outpaced Americans in technology with no better options. John agrees, and the two fly to Moscow to meet Yuri when they arrive at Yuri's home and explain the situation. Yuri tells them it will take him at least three hours to figure out the mystery behind the messages. In the meantime, John and Max decide to take a walk outside. Max asks JN why he left the FBI, to which John explains that he had opposed the NSA's AI program. Echelon, believing it was too dangerous and unethical to monitor and control citizens, protested extensively against it, but his concerns were ignored, so he ultimately decided he couldn't be part of such a morally corrupt organization and chose to leave the FBI. Three hours later, when they reconvene with Yuri, he reveals that the Echelon program hasn't fallen victim to hacking. Instead, it is autonomously transmitting messages by itself and rapidly spreading to all the computers worldwide 
like wildfire. The program's advanced intelligence had foreseen the plane crash evident from its system report. Furthermore, it predicted the surge in care company shares by accessing private messages among the company's board of directors. The program had also spread to the casino machines, helping Max win many times. However, it is still unclear why Echelon is doing all this amidst their conversation. FBI agents arrive, prompting Max and JN to steal a van in an attempt to escape. The FBI quickly gives chase, but John makes a wrong turn onto railway tracks with an oncoming train, no way out with no other option left. John employs his gun and launches an FBI agent car into the air and holds Grant at gunpoint. Grant, however, quickly clarifies that the FBI does not want to harm them. In fact, he intends to hand the phone over to Max, explaining that Echelon only wants to communicate with him. He further reveals that the NSA believes Echelon is sending messages independently. Grant assures them that he too has realized the dangerous capabilities of Echelon and wants to shut it down. Suddenly, a message pops up on the phone containing an address, which turns out to be the location where Max had previously worked as a security engineer. Upon reaching the address, the group finds a sealed-up bunker-like structure with a cache of servers and a high-end computer system that Max had a hand in installing. The phone receives another message instructing Max to authorize the server so that external data can flow in. Max follows the instructions, but suddenly the screen goes blank. After that, even the NSA's computer expert is unable to turn it on. Frustrated, they all step out of the bunker. An FBI officer informs them that the owner of this facility was one of Echelon's victims, and the place has been abandoned ever since Grant realizes that Echelon needed the servers, which is why it eliminated the owner. It was sending messages to Max because he was the only one who could authorize the servers. Grant instructs his fellow FBI agents to return home while Max and John re-enter the bunker. To Max's shock, the Echelon program has transferred itself from the NSA servers to this local system back at the NSA headquarters. Brooke was furious about how their multi-billion dollar program could just flee like this. Meanwhile, Max realizes that Echelon is upgrading itself to its ultimate capability capabilities, preparing to spread across all devices worldwide using as many servers to achieve immortality. They conclude that the NSA had prevented it from upgrading, which is why Echelon moved away from their servers. Grant contacts Brooke, who informs him that he has spoken to the president, who ordered them to allow Echelon to upgrade as they can't afford to let such an expensive program go to waste. He adds that the program was designed to safeguard American interests should be allowed to function independently. Grant disagrees and tells him that they're going to shut down Echelon no matter what. Meanwhile, as they try to find a way to shut down the Echelon, a message appears on the phone, don't try it, followed by a display showing that the Echelon has taken the entire country's wealth hostage, threatening to erase them if they attempt to intervene. Max puts his mind to work and attempts a different approach to stop the program. He talks to Echelon and asks what its true motives are. Echelon responds that its purpose is to protect America and the interests of its citizens. Max then asks Echelon to read the articles of Senate Bill 2330. Echelon begins reading numerous articles related to the topic and realizes that Echelon itself poses the greatest threat to American privacy and freedom of its citizens, understanding the consequences. Echelon self-deletes itself at the very last moment. Following this, FBI agents sent by Brooke are sent to arrest Max Max, John, and Grant for disobeying orders and shutting down the program. However, the government swiftly releases them to avoid public scrutiny and exposure. Both John and Grant are invited back to rejoin the FBI while Camilla arrives to hand Max a $3 million check sent by the casino owner, who appreciates Max's crucial role in shutting down Echelon, protecting him from future losses back in Moscow. It is revealed that Yuri is not a taxi driver but actually a Russian government officer. He reports to his superior that their mission has been successful and the Echelon program has been deleted. As it turns out the Russian government had long been aware of the immense power and threat that Echelon posed to their national security. In response, they had carefully orchestrated the entire mission, ensuring the programs were destroyed to protect their interests and neutralize the potential danger to Russia. Subscribe for more videos like this, enable notifications, and leave a like to support the channel.